All right. Well, I'm super excited about today's episode because I'm talking with my friend Stacy Graham. And, uh, you know, we got on a little call earlier to kind of talk about the podcast and both of us just kind of geeked out for, I don't know, it's half an hour or more. And we're like, oh, we should have been hitting record. So we're hitting record today so that you can get it. But, you know, if, if you're like a lot of people that are in, especially corporate America or in corporations around the world, you may have found yourself in a leadership role, but you were never really given leadership skills. You know, so many of us end up growing up in a technical area, let's say, and all of a sudden find yourself managing people. And we're thinking, holy crap, how do I do this? I don't know how to do this. How am I going to have this difficult conversation at the end of the year with an employee who isn't performing? You know what I'm talking about, right? So today I'm talking to Stacy because she's experienced some of the same things and has been helping leaders for quite a while. And so I'm excited to get Stacy on. So with that, let's go ahead and roll the episode. All right, Stacy. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. It's so good to be here with you, Jason. So excited to chat with you about all this. Well, I know we've, we've known each other for a little while and, and there were some things that I kind of saw you saying on social media and doing some other stuff. And I thought I got to talk to her because I think we're two peas in a pod, if you will, that um, we've both, we've had different career experiences, but has led us to, I think, a lot of some of the same stuff and a lot of the ways that we want to try to help people because we see so many people are just kind of floating out on the ocean without a lifeboat <laughs> right yes. and they're and they're thinking hey somebody come and help right so so first off let's just kind of set the stage so people can get to know you a little bit better just maybe explain a little bit about about your career how you've kind of gotten to this point to how you're helping people now, because I think that's important because everybody listening is is most likely going to be able to see themselves in your story, so. Absolutely, happy to. And I'll tell you, first thing, I never really expected to be in this spot, <laughs> you know? You or me either. <laughs> I think careers kind of take, you know, the path that they're meant to take for certain reasons, but yeah, let me back up to kind of the beginning and then I can kind of give some overview into how all this crazy stuff landed me where I am today. So by background, um, I actually studied engineering. So I'm an industrial and systems engineer um, and started off my career um, very much in like a hardcore engineering role. I started out in the aerospace and defense world, dappled in manufacturing. Um, and one of the things that I started observing over time um, was I, I kind of had the privilege to work with a lot of different leaders by changing some roles, getting new experiences, all that fun stuff. Um, when I was doing my master's degree, I discovered the concept of applying industrial and systems engineering knowledge to healthcare. And I, oh, that's cool. That's what lights me up. Like, how can I make things better for patients um, and their experience better and operations better? And really kind of from like a behind the scenes kind of feel. So that felt super aligned with where my heart is in helping people. So what happened? <laughs> I'll tell a little story. Um, so I moved into healthcare as an industrial engineer many years back. And I remember one of my first projects, I was led down to the operating room area and was asked by the COO. She, she said, you know, we just moved to this area and, you know, the nurses are saying we need more space, but I don't think we do. So can you solve for that? And then she walked away. And I went, uh, sure. So, so I went into like my hardcore engineering background. I created these capacity models and figure out how, figured out how to, you know, optimize the space and flow and all this technical stuff. And I worked on this for quite some time, like 
to the tune of probably a couple of months refining these perfect models. And I remember being super proud of the work I did. I went to present it and share this beautiful, perfect solution for how we make things slow and minimize cost and all that. And I shared in front of nurses and doctors and other key stakeholders in that area. And I got this look that said, nope. <laughs> and, and not only did I get the look, but I got some feedback, some verbal feedback directly, just people kind of scratching their head going, well, I see what you're saying that it's supposed to work, but it just doesn't feel right. And so my engineering head went, well, wait a minute. What about my like analysis? Like I know so, it's going to work. <laughs> it's not about feeling, right? I did all the analytics. Like what's, what's with this feeling kind of thing? And so that was a huge pivotal mo moment in my career um, because at that point, it really kind of shook me into realizing like, holy shit, like it's not just about having the technical capability to do this. It is way more important to have that connection, build the relationships, understand why people feel the way they do. And really, there's a lot more to how you make things better beyond just the technical ability to optimize. You've got to build that trust. You've got to get to know people. You've got to know what's important to them. And so that really kind of steered me into this next path that just, I think, serendipitously kind of opened up. Because what happened right after that is I ended up moving to a new organization in healthcare, also hired in as an industrial engineer, um, working in emergency department operations at that point. And I remember going to, okay, let's, let's take my industrial engineering approach. And, you know, I tried to go down that same technical path, even though I just kind of got slapped in the face about that. And my leader at that time really put the brakes on it and introduced me to this whole world of coaching and asking people questions and building that connection and, and, you know, just build, building the, um, the relationship that is so important in all of this work. And I resisted for quite some time. Um, I, I, you know, I kind of had the attitude of like, so you're saying I need to like ask people questions to get them to the same point that I'm already telling them works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally missed, <laughs> missed the point with like the importance of like knowing people as people and the, the cultural piece of, of the element of any change. And so that I feel like after that point, I even got into, um, you know, not only did the coaching piece kind of take off, but in that team, we ended up building this whole, um, this whole program around um, leadership and around how do you arm leaders with the right skills to be effective leaders. And it was just exactly the medicine that I needed <laughs> at that point in my career, because I took so much of that for granted up to that point. Well, and it's funny because, you know, again, I mean, I come from a technical background too, right? Accounting, auditing, risk management. And, and it seems like, you know, you have engineering background and we're taught in school, right? Well, look, you analyze it. You're very logical about how you make decisions, right? And that's what we get taught through all of our training. But the reality is, and you and I both know this, right? We've learned this and it sounds like, again, this is kind of where you were coming from because people are saying, look, you gotta have connection. You gotta have the relationships with people because interestingly enough, right? The way the brain makes decisions is not analytical. In fact, 95% of every decision that we make is subconscious and is emotional. And again, right, if you're listening and you're like, bullshit, Jason, that's not true. Well, there's some pretty good research done by one that I'm thinking of right now, the Max Planck Institute in Germany, that proves that is the case, right? So, so it's funny that you share that story, right? Because when, when you first went in and you got all those blank stares and everybody's saying, but I don't feel like it's right, 
right? You're probably going, what the, what the hell, right? I mean, just like you're saying, right? Well, I did all the an analytics. What do you mean, right? Mm -hmm. But how how as leaders, we actually have to bring people along emotionally as well as logically, right? And I'm guessing that's probably one of the things you've learned that makes a better leader than other leaders as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we kind of pull on that technical thread, what I see a lot of times, um, it sounds like, you know, and, and really in any kind of technical field, I mean, it can apply to so many different areas is you get, you get folks that are amazing at their jobs technically. And um, because they excel so much in their field, they end up getting those promotions and they move up the ladders and, and they get the opportunities because they're really good at what they do. But those leader, those folks aren't necessarily armed with how to be a leader. Mm -hmm. And as they're moving up in those ranks, as they get people under them that report to them, it gets really challenging for them because it's almost like a complete shift in expectations. And by the way, I don't know that those expectations are always clear as you move into leadership roles. You know, and so now you get someone who's technical, who is amazing at their job, now has a team looking up to them going, okay, what do I do? And they're going, ah, do your job, <laughs> you know? But, yeah, but what is my job? You're supposed to tell me what my job is, right? Right, right. And so you get a lot of these leaders that have naturally moved up over their careers, but don't necess necessarily have the leadership skills to develop their teams to then row all in the same direction to better serve their clients, their customers, their, their organization, whatever that is. And so what I've seen happen a lot of times is you get a leader that feels like because they're in a leadership position, now they have to do everything. They have to do more. So if someone, if one of their team members comes up to them and says, hey, I've got this problem. The leader thinks in their mind, oh, I'm the leader. I must take this problem and solve it for them. And that is the opposite <laughs> of what they, what they could be doing to develop their people and creating a stronger team. And you get a lot of these leaders that end out having a ton of work and a ton of firefighting, and they're taking all the problems from their team, but they're missing the skill set on how to develop their team to be those independent problem solvers, to be, you know, to have that, that contribution um, in their own unique talents and their own unique ways so they can be stronger as a team, not just having the leader do more work. Yeah, because I mean, it, it seems, right, to make total sense. But like you said, so many people just jump on that and think, oh, well, if my team's not doing what they need to do, then as a leader, I need to be the one that does it. So leaders end up working long hours, you know, doing other things and never really giving their team the opportunity to actually do their job because they're doing it for them, right? I mean, it's just as silly as if we were in a war, right? And so, you know, you, you've, you've got some issue going on and all of a sudden, you know, the captains and colonels are coming in and saying, oh, we got a problem. And the general goes, well, don't worry about it. You guys just go back and sit in your tents and I'm going to go out and win the <laughs> war for us by ourselves, by myself, right? Yeah. Yeah. That wouldn't, that wouldn't work in the real life, in real life, you know, if in a warfare situation, but isn't that kind of what it sounds like a lot of leaders are actually doing? And, and, and I guess technically they're literally kind of killing themselves just like the general would kill themselves if he or she chose to just go out and try to do everything that the team should be doing. Absolutely. I, I had a, a story came to mind as you were talking through your example. Um, when I moved into the, the role I'm in right now, um, I came from a team where we, in our, it was the coolest culture. We would have a problem and we would all sit together and brainstorm it and we would coach each other. So in this last team I was on, we, if we had an issue, we would bring it to the team and you would never get an answer. You would be coached on coming up with that question on your, or with the answer on your own, but you would never get an answer outright because how are you going to get better at problem solving if you don't take the time to think through things on your own? 
And the story that came up for me is I remember one of my previous bosses, um, I had just started in a new role. Once I had really gotten to this point of, of you know, realizing the power of coaching and, and problem developing people to problem solve, problem solve independently. And I asked him a question when I started this new role and he goes, oh, okay. And, and he kind of starts answering it for me. And then he shoots off an email to this person to, to do it for me, basically. And I remember getting so mad at him. <laughs> I was like, why did you give me the answer? You need to coach me to like ask me questions and help me figure it out on my own. And he was like, oh, like I didn't even realize. I'm like, teach me to fish. I don't want you solving all my problems. I want you having a dialogue with me back and forth so we can get to that, you know, solution. But I don't, if you continue to do things for me, you're not empowering me to operate as the independent adult that I am. I mean, if you think about it, everyone who's on a team are functioning adults outside of work, right? Like they have mortgages and families and they have to pay their own bills and make their own decisions. Exactly. And- like we're remembering to pick up our kids. Like we're making choices about what to have for dinner or what house to buy or, you know, whatever. We're all making these adults and driving forward independently. So why is it that when we come into work, you see people that all of a sudden turn into not knowing how to make any decisions on their own and they look to their leader. Dare, dare I say that we haven't given the leader the skill set and to teach their folks and empower them yeah. to figure some of that stuff out on, the, on their own. Like, how do we keep them that capable, problem-solving, independent thinking adult within the walls of work? Well, it's funny because one of, one of the sayings that I like to, that I, that I use for myself, I don't know if I came up with it or I heard it somewhere, but you know, because a lot of times leaders complain about their employees acting like children. And I'm like, well, if you treat your employees like children, how else do you expect them to act? Right. And so, like you said, if you, if, if, if we take away all their adulting skills while they're in the, in the job force, that doesn't make any sense. And, and, and the interesting thing too, is because you were talking about that, you know, again, kind of from some of the motive motivation stuff that I've read, as far as why people are motivated or what they more want more from work one of the biggest things that they want is they want that responsibility they want that accountability they want to be able to make the decisions and so when you take that away from people right they don't feel satisfied at work and what do you think is going to happen if people at work don't feel satisfied they're going to leave, right? I mean, we've been seeing that actually these last few months here in the US with so many people. I mean, it's like nine, nine or 10 million people in the last couple of months have quit their job. Mm -hmm. Whoa, that's, I mean, we're a big country, but that's a lot of people. It is, it is. I think, you know, one of the things that actually just came up this week with a leader that I had is I think, I think there's a lot of fear around giving clear expectations. Mm. So one of the things that I've seen come up quite often with leaders is I'll, you know, I'll have a discussion with them one-on-one about a situation and I'll get the feedback. Well, isn't that obvious? Shouldn't they just know that? And so then I ask them like, how, how do you, how did you clarify your expectations? Have you explicitly told them what you're expecting? Oh, well, that's just common sense. You know, and so you get you get these situations where, where I see some leaders get frustrated with folks not executing the behavior that's in their head, but they haven't necessarily communicated those expectations, you know, and so and so you get and, and it's interesting because I've had these types of conversations before and, and what I see is a lot of um, I get I've heard some feedback around, well, I don't want to like insult people by over explaining something. And so I always go back to one of my favorite Brene Brown quotes, clarity is kind, unclear is unkind. And it's as simple as that. Oh, you know, explaining something to make sure that people understand what their expectations are, that is kindness. Well, and how can we ever expect anyone 
to meet our expectations if we're not clear about what those expectations are. Yeah. Right. And in that, that same behavior that you're seeing come up with leaders that you're working with, you know, is the same kind of behavior that, you know, sometimes we have in our personal relationships. Right. So I, I know there's a lot of times where my wife will ask me to do something or she will expect that I would notice something <laughs> and should therefore do it. Right. Because she yeah. notices it. Right. And, and again, I mean, this happens in any relationship, right? Like, Hey, I noticed that it's a certain time of the day and she hasn't made the bed yet. So <laughs> she's really hoping or the expectation is I'm going to show her that I love her by making the bed without being asked. Right. Yep. But chances are I haven't even gone in the bedroom. I have no fucking clue <laughs> as to yep. whether the bed is made or not. Right. Yep. I haven't been in there since I got up in the morning. And so, you know, then if she gets disappointed with me, well, you know, again, how am I supposed to know if she never made the expectation, right? As yeah. opposed to her in the morning saying, you know what, today it'd be really nice if you could make the bed. Sure, honey, I would be happy to do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then we don't have those conversations. But without having the conversation, like you said, it's, it's actually kind of unkind mm -hmm. to not share with people. Because then again, as a leader, you're going to have to hold people accountable for it. Right. You're going to have to have those performance discussions with them. And is it their fault or your fault if you haven't given them the expectation? I would say it's the leader's fault. Totally. And if you don't have that clear expectation, then therefore you don't have a boundary and therefore you don't have leverage for consequence. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like some leaders get stuck is going, ah, they should just know and gosh, this is ridiculous, you know, and, and, and they, they want to invoke some sort of like consequence for just not knowing, but it's like, well, if you didn't make very, you know, clear explicitly what that is, you know, that accountability only works if you're clear on what that is they're being held accountable for. <laughs> yeah. It's well, and, it, and it's, and it's not fair to hold somebody accountable for something they didn't even know about. Right? Exactly. I mean, even in the law, right. So there, there is, there is a legal concept you know, I've got some technical legal background too, but, you know, of, of uh, failure to know the law, right, is, is sometimes a defense, right? Because again, it's, it's if, if you don't know, or it hasn't been communicated to you, then how are you expected to know, right? Absolutely. Now, once you know, then it's your responsibility at that point. Right. right. But it's just, you know, yeah, very interesting. Very it is interesting. interesting. And, you know, so I was cracking up as you were mentioning your bed making example, because <laughs> I have to share a couple of years ago. Um, I remember having a conversation with with some of my girlfriends around Mother's Day. And, you know, the you know, you hear the, the stories around like, oh, like he didn't get me the flowers that I would hope or this day was, you know, I had to cook Mother's Day dinner, you know, and kind of these gripes around like what that day looks like, right? And I remember going, well, shit, I'm just going to make him a list this year. And so what I did, <laughs> this is, and I've done this every year. I mean, my list is generally the same at this point, but I like explicitly said like, this would be a perfect Mother's Day for me. And I like laid out the day. And I put like specific examples of things I would like, things that I don't want to do. And I just made it super clear. And, and my husband was very thankful for that list. I would be very thankful <laughs> for a list like that, right? It's like, boohoo, I can knock it out of the park because you're giving me the rules of the game. So yeah, and, and he crushed it. I mean, he was, and I, and I said, look, like if that doesn't work based on, you know, stuff you have going on or the kids or whatever, that's fine. I was like, this is my wish list. And damned if he didn't basically, you know, support everything on my wish list. He had a great day because, you know, every, everything was clear. I was in my element because I got this, you know, wonderful Mother's Day. I felt super loved. But it's like, it just goes back to that clarity. Like it's so much, life is so much easier when you can be clear with people. And, and one of the things that I think kind of is challenging for some leaders is you have to have vulnerability to be clear because sometimes if you don't know if you're clear you got to ask your people 
And you got to put yourself out there. And if you're not be being very clear on how you're communicating, you, that's something to, to work on and get feedback on. But that's okay. But you can't know if you're being if you're excelling at your communication unless you ask, and that requires vulnerability. Well, especially because there's there's always that fear, right? That that as a leader, we're gonna look like we don't know what we're talking about. God forbid. Yeah, you know, and it's 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 well, there's a there's a whole fallacy behind that too. But anyway, I don't know if we want to go down that path or not, but. <laughs> But, you know, you, you, you've kind of shared a little bit about your background, right? And some of the stuff that you've seen, and, and I'm sure, you know, again, you've seen what makes a good leader, what doesn't make a good leader, right? So maybe we can talk about some of that and, and kind of how, how you're helping people now too, right? Because obviously, as you've gone through your experience, you know, just like we were talking about with expectations, most leaders don't give good expectations, right? So what does that look like? And how can I help people? Or, you know, wh what are you doing to try to help people? Because your story is very similar to mine, where we came up technically, and we just got thrown into it, and we had to figure out what the hell to do, mm -hmm. right? And there's a lot of people that are in the exact same situation that you and I both were in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, um, it's interesting. I feel like I've just been so, I feel so grateful for where my, my career path has gone because I'm now at the point now where I've worked with over 60 different executives in, in, multiple, um, in multiple types of industries. You know, whether it's healthcare, we talked about automotive, aerospace manufacturing, I mean, covered a, a wide variety of things over the years. And I've always been fascinated with leadership since day one. And one of the things, you know, to kind of go back to what you were just saying, as I started kind of mapping out all these different leaders and, and, and putting together, what are those characteristics? What are those qualities where I saw that leader be successful? Right. And, and in my terms, I'm defining successful as they had a happy, productive, effective team. They're meeting their metrics. They're excelling. They're growing. They don't have a ton of turnover. Everyone's involved in conversations. There's, there's good camaraderie. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so funny what you were saying before, because one of the things that pops out with, with this data set is some of the best leaders say, I don't know. They say, I don't know. And then they figure it out or they ask questions of their team members and they in invite that dialogue. So the best leaders don't have all the answers. And that's something that I feel like is a really tough pill to swallow, especially with new leaders, because you go, you get into this position and you think, okay, so being a leader is synonymous with having the answers for my people. Like I have to have the answers for my people. But what you're doing is you're actually doing them a disservice for their growth, for your growth, by not admitting when you might not know something. You know, leaders, I think leaders, so many leaders underestimate um, really kind of the power that they have in their organizations, on their teams. Um, I mean, I work with a ton of executives right now and I'll give them some feedback on what they said and they go, oh, really? Like people took it that way? Or, or you think that could be a problem? And I go, everyone is looking at you. You set the tone for the culture. You set the tone for the environment. What you're modeling, what your behaviors are doing, Everyone is looking up to you on how they should act, how they should perform in this culture. And I think, you know, the power in just recognizing that is huge, that everyone, it's, it's like being a parent, right? Like your kids are looking up to you for like what to do and how to behave. And so whatever you're modeling as a parent, whatever you're modeling as a leader, that's what people are going to latch on to. 
Well, it's interesting that you use that analogy, right? Because again, we can all think about, I mean, every family is different, right? But, but, but as a leader, if you think about effectively like that, what kind of a parent am I being? Right. And I've seen leaders that are abusive leaders. I mean, it's the equivalent of, you know, the dad beating up on the physically beating up or sexually molesting or doing other stuff. I mean, I've, there, there's what most of us would consider dysfunctional families that are out there, but we also see dysfunctional teams too. Right. And, and I think part of it, like you said, is that that added level of responsibility. It's not just about meeting your metrics, getting the shit done that you've got to get done, but it's also about developing and nurturing your teams as well, right? And we already know as a parent, right? We both have kids. They don't come with an owner's manual. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And each one of them is different. Right. Yeah. But but as leaders, I see so many leaders, too, that try to treat everyone exactly the same. Right. Yeah. Try to parent each of your kids exactly the same and see where that gets you. Exactly. Exactly. One of the best pieces of advice I got um, from a leader, I remember I was starting another situation where I was starting in a new role. I had a one on one with him and I remember him asking me, like, how it's going. Like that ultimate question, right? How's it going? <laughs> and, uh, and so I spent probably 20, 30 minutes word vomiting all the things I was stressed out about. And now I'm not learning quick enough. And I need to know this. And now I need to build my skill set here. And, you know, all, all kind of stuff that I felt like I needed to know yesterday. And he listens like a really good leader, right? So he listened. <laughs> and at the end of it, he asked me if he could give me some advice. And I was like, yes, yes, give me advice. (laughs) And he goes, Stacy, just care for people. Just care for people and the rest will fall into place. The metrics will fall into place. Everything is going to fall into place. Just care for people. See how you can help them. And I remember that felt like I mean, I just felt like a ton of bricks fell off my shoulders and I walked away from that going, holy shit, is it that easy? Like I can do that. Like I care for people. Absolutely. You know, and it it was, that was another very pivotal point in my leadership journey where it was, it almost like, it was almost like he gave me permission to be myself, you know, and and to really, because I love getting to know people. I love helping people with things and getting to know what makes them tick and getting to know them, you know, on a personal level too. And um, that just, it felt like such a relief. And so I feel like with leaders, care for your people and care can look so many different ways, right? Like caring about them as people outside of work. I mean, do you know what, your team members' kids' names are? Do you know if they have hobbies outside of work? That stuff matters. Like you don't need to be best friends, right? With everyone that reports to you, but get to know your team as people. That fosters that connection, you know? And it's, and it, <laughs> in order for it to be genuine, that requires the leader to be vulnerable and also share things about themselves personally. Because anyone can see through the bullshit, like, let me get to know you. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you yeah, know there's, I mean? there's an authentic way and there's the bullshit way. There is. There yeah. is. And, and, and everyone can feel that. Everyone knows that. Like, and I hate to, you know, take this example, this one that popped in my head. Like, if I walk into the bank sometimes and they ask me, like, oh, like, how's your day going? How's this? And like, it, it just feels so scripted to me. Like, like, do they really care? I don't know. <laughs> or is it just part of what they're supposed to do? I don't know. But, but there is, there's a big difference between authentic connection, which requires that shared vulnerability. Um, but that is part of caring. It is getting to know your people because 
when you have a healthy culture and you can foster an environment where people can be themselves, they can feel like they, they belong on a team, right? That's where you get people all of a sudden sharing more ideas. All of a sudden they're speaking up more in meetings. They're giving creative, innovative solutions to things. It's like, how do you, how do you cultivate that environment that allows people to bloom and share their own talents. And I think so much of that is connection. Well, and, and, and let's go down that path a little bit because I think one of the myths, or at least, you know, what I've seen, I, I'm old enough now that I've kind of seen <clears throat> how we used to do business, how we do business now. And so I can, I can just hear people that are listening, maybe pushing back a little bit and saying, oh, no, right? In today's environment, we really have to keep business and personal separate because, you know, I can't tell an off-colored joke because that might be construed as sexual harassment. I can't get to know somebody because I might find out some information about them that I'm not supposed to know. Or, you know, I can't do my job right if I feel emotionally attached to the people that I work with, right? Because how can I be a leader, you know, and, and bring the hammer down on somebody if they're not performing, you know, if, if I actually care about them as a human being, right? I'm not supposed to do that at work. And it feels like, especially the last, you know, five, 10 years, maybe even starting back 20 years ago, we've started swinging the pendulum right to where now and, and i've talked with this with other friends that i have it just it feels like corporate america is so sterile right like you know you got to be really careful about you can't say this you can't say that you can't you know sort of a thing too to where it feels like some leaders just don't want to deal with any of the emotion because I think they're afraid they're going to get themselves in trouble. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's that one side, I'm afraid I'm going to get myself in trouble. There's the other side of, I have no fucking clue how to actually do this and, <laughs> and how to be emotional, how to have those authentic connections. I don't know how to do that. Right. So you got, you got people kind of on both, both scales there. So, but it sounds like the best leaders are the ones who actually do it. They are, they are. And, 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 you know, sure. Yeah. You don't want to be telling, you know, those off color jokes, but I, I guarantee you, everyone has met a stranger for the first time. Right. Like how do you connect with a, a new friend outside of work? You know, have you had any sort of experience where you've met someone new for the first time and how do you get to know them? How can you apply some, uh, you know, rather than being fearful of the you know, the implications of, you know, the rules we have in place, which by the way, they're there for a reason. They should be there for a reason. But there are things you can do to create connection. And I think that really requires courage and bravery from the leader to take the first step. Hmm. Yeah, because that's the only way that it's actually going to come, right? Right. Is right. The, the leader has to be willing to take the first step we have to give first because yep. uh, that's what's interesting is um you know maybe kind of back to that authentic versus bullshit getting to know people right mm -hmm. is you know and it works this way under the principles of influence and everything too right where there's reciprocity but reciprocity means you got to give first yeah. so if i want to get to know you right I have to feel comfortable or have the courage to probably share something about myself before I ask you to share, right? That's, that's true. It, it is. And I think, you know, even if we, I, I'll tell you, I mean, yes, we could certainly go down that path. And I, I yes, I, I ultimately believe that it is up to the leader to be that courageous model and model that behavior. But you don't need to get like super touchy feely with this stuff either. I mean, some of this can start with those famous three words, I don't know. I mean, I have seen, I've kind of experimented with some of this stuff with various leaders over the years. And 
started just being a lot more transparent. If I don't know something, admitting it. And it's really interesting because even something as simple as that and sharing that with them, well, you know, the next time I have a conversation with them, all of a sudden they're a little bit more open too. You know, and I had I had a situation um, a couple months ago where I intentionally started being a lot more open with a particular leader that I'm building a relationship with. And I shared with him, you know, some of my concerns, some of the things, you know, I don't know yet. And just in general, just tried to be very like authentic and open about, um, you know, various things at work. And I remember we were going to have a call that was, you know, somewhat contentious potentially. And out of the blue, he texted me and says, I'm really worried about this call. And there is no way that he would have admitted that or shared that with me six months ago if I hadn't first taken the steps to me personally being way more vulnerable with this person. And so by me modeling that like, hey, I don't know, I have things to learn, like here's where I'm kind of struggling, that then gave him permission to reciprocate that with me. And now that relationship with this person is so much stronger than it's ever been. I feel like before making those steps, both of us were pretty closed off. It was kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I'm good. Like everything's fine. No, we're fine. Good. And, but now, you know, because both of us are choosing, right. We're choosing to be more open about things. It is so, the relationship is just so much better. And because the relationship is better, now we can bring things to the table that would have felt awkward or weird, or we wouldn't have wanted to admit before. And if we're bringing those things to the table, that's making our team better. It's making the organization better. It's making us be able to ultimately serve people in the way that we want to serve people. So by taking that chance, by taking that step of courageous action to admit something you don't know, that is, that is ultimately what creates that shared learning and that growth in a culture and a team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it takes it takes a leader actually having the courage to do something to begin with. And like you said, I mean, this one, this example that you just gave, this has been a six month process. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think this is another thing for people to realize, right, is sometimes, I mean, almost everything in our life, we can take a pill, we can, you know, we want the immediate, you know, Amazon next day delivery sort of thing. But but what we're talking about, anything that is valuable for the long term takes a longer term to develop as it well, does. right? It and does. It, and it's almost kind of like a courting, if you will, right? I mean, you know, same thing is like if you if you're you know out courting, uh, you know, dating people to maybe be in a, be, be in a long term relationship, you're not going to know everything you need to or have the kind of relationship after the first date to get married, right? It just doesn't happen that way. Right. But you've got to you've got to do things and and take time, you know, for you to be able to to get to that point. It does. Yeah. Those relationships, they do take time. And and that's, you know, kind of the interesting part about doing all this work, too, is wanting, you know, that immediate connection and just wanting things to be, you know, at a certain level. And it just takes time. That's part of building relationships. That's part of, you know, if you were to ask someone, you know, how long they've known their best friend you know, it's probably years, right? Like, I don't think they were a best friend on day one, right? Like they probably saw like a spark in the other person that, you know, they felt drawn to and that, you know, over time that relationship built and that that authenticity and transparency, you know, became part of, you know, that relationship. But no, it's not something that happens immediately. And that's why, to me, that's why it's so important for leaders to be intentional with building opportunities for connection with their teams. If you're not intentional about how to create that connection, it's not gonna happen. It's too easy to just be busy. There's always more work to do. 
there will always be something else to be done. No one's to-do list is ever done in work. But how can you be intentional about carving out the time just to shoot the shit with people, especially in a world right now where everyone's so remote? You know, I remember, you know, being on a team where we were literally all in the same room. It was a big room. There's like, you know, half a dozen desks or so. And we would all come in and we would talk about our work and we'd build connection. We'd talk about our weekends. That's gone now. With a lot of people's work with COVID and all the, the you know, changes that have happened in the workforce, those environments are few and far between now. So how, do you, how can you as a leader still facilitate that connection, those, you know, I'll use my official term, shoot the shit moments. You know, how can that you- is an official term, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but how can you be intentional with that connection? Because it is so critical. It is so critical to just carve out that time to just give someone a call without the intention of asking them to do something. <laughs> right. Well, because that's the important thing too, right? Is it's like, is, is, and I can tell that from business and personal relationships too, right? Is it's like, if somebody just reaches out, they don't know me and they're asking for something the first time they contact me, it ain't going to happen, right? Or if you haven't talked to me in five years and all of a sudden, even if we had a great relationship before, but all of a sudden you reach out and need something from me, you know, I'm not being an asshole by saying no, but it's like, I feel like I'm being used exactly. and anybody would feel like they're being used if you haven't developed that relationship before you have to have an ask. Right. That's why I like the analogy of the, I call it the emotional bank account, right. That you can use with relationships, any relationship, right. And every little thing you do is like, you're adding coin mm -hmm. to that emotional piggy bank. Mm -hmm. And because at certain points, you're going to have withdrawals, you're going to do something that pisses the other person off, it's going to take away some of that, right. But it's those little things that you're going to be doing that you're intentional about doing, giving them a phone call, saying, Hey, I just, you know, how did how did your daughter do at her soccer tournament? I know you mentioned that she, you know, you guys were going, you know, up, up north, you know, for a soccer tournament this weekend. It's the little things like that, that when you pick up, it actually shows people that you are listening and you do actually care about them. It's so important. I mean, and stuff like that takes five minutes. You know, I remember, you know, another story here. Um, I had a boss once who, you know, as I was kind of getting my feet wet on his team, I remember he called me just on his commute into work. He called me, you know, once a week, maybe twice at the beginning and just said, how you doing? There was no, you know, secret message behind it about, oh, I need this done by X or do this or whatever. Like he literally, honestly, just cared for me. And that's it. And that meant so much, so much that I would get these random calls I mean, maybe they were a minute long. Maybe they were two minutes. It did not take much effort at all on his part, but it meant the world to me because it felt like, oh, like he cares about me. Like this person cares that I'm doing okay as I'm starting something new and difficult. Or, you know, even if, it, even if I wasn't new on the team, you know, just reaching out to check in and say, hey, just want to see how things are going. You need anything? How can I support you? Well, yeah. and, and, and so let's let's flip it around a little bit, right? Because you're you're sharing that example, and, the, and again, I'm guessing that was somebody that you worked for, or somebody that was in a leadership role above you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The fact that you know he called you, how did that make you act differently as an employee working for that person? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, I mean that because made... we're usually always talking from the leader down about what yeah. you should do, but let's let's talk the experience back up, right? That those couple of minutes that, that that leader was investing, what did it mean for how you showed up as an employee? I mean, it made me show up honestly more courageously, more confident because I knew that he had my back. Mm -hmm. And so it made me feel like, oh, like, cool. Like I'm not alone, like on this island, like I have support if I need it. You know, um, I have a phone, a friend, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it made me also like, 
motivated to get up to speed as quickly as I can, right? It made me motivated to want to like tell him about my wins the next time I got like a random call from him about something, you know, rather than me using his time for me to like ask questions about something that I didn't know, like I was now turning it into like, oh, cool. Okay. So what can I show him that I learned? You know, like what, what can I, what can I share with him? And, and to me, like that just felt so huge, especially being on a team where geographically we're dispersed all over the place. And so I didn't see people physically very often. And it's easy to get that mentality of feeling alone and feeling like, well, shit, does any of this even matter? Does anyone care? You know, and so by by those one or two minutes, like literally one or two minutes, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week that he would spend with me, that was enough to light a spark for me and make me want to learn more, be more, show up and really just serve in the best capacity I could because I knew that I was supported and I knew that it was appreciated. I knew he cared. Yeah. So for any for everybody listening, right, some of you may be going, I don't know if it's worth that minute or two. Did you just hear how Stacy lit up when she talked about that boss? You know, was it worth the few minutes? Was it worth being intentional? Was it worth, you know, developing that relationship over time? Uh, yeah. And you can just hear from her voice, right? And I mean, I know I've, I've worked for people that I just loved. I thought the world of, I would, I would die for that person. There's other people I work for, asshole, bitch, whatever you want to, you know, good riddance. If they drop dead next to me, I would be happy, right? In fact, a few people I worked for, I actually had some <laughs> not good thoughts about how they would drop dead next to me. And, you know, <laughs> anyway, um, so you can see the difference, right? But again, it's it's about us being courageous, authentic, being intentional, actually, you know, doing some of these things. And I know, you know, one of the words that you use at the beginning when we started talking was coaching. And I know probably a lot of people that are listening, you and I are both coaches, you know, been trained that way. We kind of understand what it is, but most people don't. So maybe if you can give kind of a little tips or just kind of explain a little bit, what does it look like when a leader is actually you know, being a coach instead of just telling people what to do? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head with that last word, telling, right? So one of the biggest differences I see in coaching, coaching is about asking, not telling. It's about figuring out the right open-ended questions to get people out of their own way. It's about getting them to think um, think through um, their problems, where they are now, where they want to be. One of the best tools that I've ever learned was around kata coaching. And my, my mentor, Ken Pallone, introduced me to this years ago. And it is such an amazing, simple tool to help develop your team, to coach your team into becoming independent problem solvers. And so what this kata coaching, there's a little card actually, it used to attach to my badge. So it's like C-O-T-A or how do you spell that? So if people K-A-T-A. want to- K-A-T-A. And if you Google K-A-T-A. it, there's plenty out there on Google. Um, the name of the, the gentleman who came up with this is escaping my mind right now, but you can see it on the, on the yep. website there. Oh, I, oh, it's Mike Rother actually, it comes from Mike Rother. But this tool is really, we put it on our badge card. And when we developed, in a last role I had, we developed this leadership transformation program. (laughs) And one of the things we had folks do is kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this, where we were looking at continuous improvement. So as we improve as an organization, implement projects to improve operations, how come they're not sustained? Okay, so that's one of kind of the key issues with any sort of improvement work is that sustainability. When we did an analysis on that, we figured out, well, gee, we're not giving leaders the skill sets to even know how to sustain improvements. 
So how do we expect them to be able to do that? And so one of the things that came out of this was using this Kata coaching card and what it essentially does and how we helped coach leaders on this is when someone comes to you with a problem, one of your team members, someone who reports to you, what you can do then instead of taking, instead of taking the monkey off their back and saying, oh, I will take your problem. I will save the day and solve it for you. <laughs> Rather, while well, the monkey is scratching your eyes. <laughs> well, and it's fighting with the other monkeys from the other yeah, reports, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but what you can do, and we had folks be intentionally transparent with this. We had them pull out their little badge card and say, I am trying to become a better leader. I'm trying to grow too. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions to help you solve this. And so what they would do is they would pull this out. And this card has a series of questions that basically has folks think through where are they now? Where do they want to be? What have you tried? What obstacles are getting you to where you want to be? And really kind of having that reflection around experimentation, right? So if you've heard the terminology, plan, do, check, act, mm -hmm. that comes kind of the lean world. And really that this card is laying out that problem solve methodology. And so what that then enabled leaders to do is they were no longer taking the monkey and they were also developing their people and, and giving them permission to, to solve problems on their own. And that's a huge difference. I feel like in a lot of our culture, we talked about how in years past, it was very much like command and control, do what I tell you to do. And now that's turned more. Um, and so now this is kind of giving folks the ability to say, how do we develop our people to, to trust and to try things? How do we let them try experimentation within guardrails? And so this card enabled people to become independent problem solvers. It gave them permission to try things. They didn't have to go to their leader and say, you know, Miss, Mr. So-and-so, can I try this thing? It was like, yeah, I expect you to go try it and let me know how it went. Like you're a fully functioning independent adult and, you know, I trust you within the guardrails that, you know, I've developed that you can figure this stuff out on your own. And so it was really funny because I remember when we first started using this card with leaders, they would take it out and, and you would get these, you would get folks coming up to them with a problem. It was kind of like, you know, elbow to elbow coaching at this point. You would get folks coming up to them with a problem and they would start pulling out their card and the direct report, the team member would be like, ah, oh, I know what's card. coming. They knew and they hated it. They hated it because it's, it's a lot easier, right? To just pass along a problem, <laughs> but it's also not developing their skill set. <laughs> and so it was funny. You had a lot of grumbling at the beginning as you kind of had these conversations and, and helped coach people through it, talk through it, right? This is not just about, about asking the questions. It's also about, you know, having the dialogue with them around, you know, what they've tried and all that. So it's not, you know, sterilely asking questions and walking away. But what was so- Do you, have, do you have to read the questions in monotone too? Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> But what was so funny about this experiment is when I was working with this particular leader, she would pull out this card, you know, at the beginning of all this, um, we did this for about a year and her folks would grumble for a while. And then we, we the next progression we saw is we, she would pull out the card and they would start answering the questions as they're walking up to her. Well, yes, here's no. the situation. Here's where I want to be. This is what I've tried. This is where I'm stuck. And that is where the leader comes into play. If there's a barrier that, you know, the direct report, the team member can't resolve, then absolutely, let's get the leader in there if it's something out of control of the direct report. But until that point, like, let's try and see what you can own on your own. And then it was so funny, it got to the point where she didn't even like really have to pull the card out. Like people would come up to her and be like, oh, so-and-so just wanted to let you know, I had this issue yesterday. This is where we're at. This is where we want to be. This is what I tried and it worked. So I did that. And it was almost just like an update. Good. Thank you. Had, yeah, like, okay, great. Good job. <laughs> and it was like the coolest thing because you saw, you know, this leader get unloaded from all these problems that she was taking on from her direct reports. And then you saw the growth and development from her team members into figuring stuff out on their own, solving it on their own and being proud of the contribution they're making to make their team better. 
Well, I think that this this Kata card too is a, is a great um, example, you know, because again, we kind of started off talking about a lot of times leaders get thrown into this. They've got a technical background, but they don't have some of the, what I like to call tools, right? Because I grew up on a construction site, so I'm very familiar with hand, you know, with hammers and, you know, different stuff like that. And I think most of us are familiar with that and realize the importance of tools when we're trying to do a project. But we don't realize that we don't have tools in our toolbox as a leader. So giving people tools like a Kata card, right, is a way that now those people can actually, I got a tool, right? Somebody comes up and I can kind of go through and, and remember how to do it. The more you do it, the more you get used to it. You don't have to look at it anymore. I mean, this is the example you just shared, right? But but without having tools like that, you're just kind of stuck, mm -hmm. right? And I know I think that's what you're you're doing more and more of is actually helping give people some of these tools, yeah. right? Give them some of the tools, help them get clear. And to me, <coughs> to me, you know, kind of going back to that statement around caring for your people. Caring for your people, to me, kind of falls into two buckets. One way you can be clear is, or I'm sorry, to care for people is to be clear on things. So you care for people by, be, by being clear, by building connection, by building the culture you want for your people to thrive and foster that innovation and creativity. So that's kind of the one bucket of caring. The other bucket of caring is stuff like the tools. Okay, so it's, it's being clear on how, how they can specifically do that. It's, it's um, giving people a vision, being clear on what your strategy is, where you're going, where, you know, why you're going there, where you're going there, and how they contribute to that vision. You know, strategy is such a key part of what I work with leaders on too, because ultimately, if you don't have vision, then how are you all going to align on what the right work is? to accomplish what you want to accomplish. And so part of the things that come into caring for people in the context of strategy and vision is creating some of those structures and processes to help make clear what it is people are contributing to and how they fit into this, this picture of this team or this enterprise, whatever it is. So caring for people involves creating that intentional culture, creating that connection, but then also developing that strategy, that vision, and the structures and processes that a lot of people roll their eyes at, but is such a key part of caring for people. Going back to what we were talking about with expectations, processes and structure create those clear expectations. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because as, as you were kind of summarizing there at the end, kind of what it what it means to you actually for a leader to be caring and the things that, that kind of fall under that, you know, again, going back to kind of what I made reference to before about like the reasons why people leave jobs or the reasons why people stay in jobs. You know, another one is, I don't know where I fit into this. I don't see how what I'm doing helps the bigger picture. That's again, part of your vision and strategies. Another one is I don't feel like I have what I need to be successful. There's some of the tools, right? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure what expectations people have of me, or I don't have good communication as to what's actually going on, right? These are all reasons why people quit jobs, yep. right? And, and, you know, again, most people think it's money. It ain't money for why people leave jobs. It's all of these other things. And exactly what we've been talking about now for almost an hour is just as simple as, you know, that person told you, just care for people, just care for people. And you've kind of got a roadmap now of what that actually looks like. And again, it's not, you know, giving everybody hugs and singing Kumbaya. Okay, that might be relevant for some people, but other people it's not, right? Or may not be appropriate in the environment that you're in. But there are still ways that you can be intentional and care about other people as a human being, see other people as a human being, treat other people as a human being, 
And when you do, it sounds like that's really kind of the recipe of great leaders that you've seen. Absolutely. And again, you've been in lots of industries, right? So it doesn't matter. Aerospace, manufacturing, healthcare, all of these things, it sounds like, right? So correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm gathering from you is these are all characteristics of great leaders, regardless of what level you are in an organization, regardless of what industry you're in, probably even regardless if you run your own business, right? If you're the owner, uh, and even probably some of the same things that we should be using in our personal relationships and with our children uh, and other relationships with family and friends too. Absolutely. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head at the end there. I think whether you're in the corporate world, which I know we've talked about, or you're an entrepreneur, you know, or you're a parent, like all this stuff applies. I remember using the Kata card on my one-year-old just to experiment. I mean, there are so many parallels and so much of this boils down to seeing people as human beings and connecting with them as humans, being clear on expectations, and then using those tools at your disposal to help support them. Great stuff. Great stuff. And I know, unfortunately, I could keep on going for a couple more hours, but we need to, <laughs> you need to get back. I need to get back. We need to let people get back. But um, Stacy, thank you for this. And I, and I know, again, I mean, you've started helping more and more leaders now. So again, I mean, if people listen to this and they're like, man, that's Stacy, I, I need to get to know her better. How, how, how is it that people can, can reach out to you or kind of know what else you're doing to tr try to help leaders? Yeah. So you can reach out to me. Um, I'm on social media. So on Instagram, that's probably the best way to contact me. So uh, my handle is at Stacy S C that's S T A C E Y S C. And from there, you'll see a link in my bio around how to connect with me and we can have a chat and kind of see if, if we're a good fit and how I can help you. Cause ultimately like, gosh, I just look back on all this and I'm like, why did it take me so long to, to start, you know, helping other people beyond what I'm doing now? There's just, you know, 15 plus years of learning all this that I'm just so excited to now finally be helping other people with. It's really exciting. Well, well I know. And that's one of the reasons why I like you so much too, because like I said, you and I had very similar, but different career experiences where again, we were throwing in We've spent the last, you know, 15 for you, 25 plus for me on just trying to figure this out, right? And it's like, if we can do anything to help people so they don't have to take that long to figure it out, you can avoid a lot of pain and frustration in your life. And believe me, you, I've had plenty of that over my career. And, you know, there's, there's things that Stacy's learned that she shared with you today, that if you just do them, you're going to shave years, years of time off of your learning curve. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure to be here, Jason. Thank you so much for having me on this. Thank you, Stacy. And, uh, you know, keep caring for people and seeing people as human beings. That's again, one of the greatest lessons in business and in life in general. So, and be authentic yourself. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much.